understand the signs that are performing in order to correct it. And I have to say, that's a trick in itself. Wow. So, I mean, but, but then you, you also had a little bit of a military background, is that correct? Well, that is correct. I, I still am in the military. I am a, a, a colonel in the Italian Air Force. And um, so I, I, once I, once I uh, was selected in the Italian Air Force, I, I stayed in. And I've been in the military for the past quarter of a century, 25 years, from second lieutenant, of, well, from cadet, all the way through the different steps to colonel. Wow. Okay, so now we know you, you, you got into the, the astronaut corps and, and you obviously from ESA, which is the European mm -hmm. Space Agency, and, and NASA and, and JAXA and all the, and Roscosmos, all the agencies do work together, especially on the International Space Station. So you got to fly uh, probably, I think it was 2009-ish? 13. Um, 2000, was, was your, but you, you, were, you, you made the astronaut corps in 2009, is that correct? That's, that's right. And then you only flew in 2013. Was your training any different to, to the, the Russian Space Agency and, and NASA, or did you train with them? Did you train as a cosmonaut? Uh, uh, what, what do you call a European astronaut? We call ourselves astronauts. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad idea. I like that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we just, um, so yeah, there are, there are different nomenclatures. We know that um, the Russians prefer the term cosmonaut because uh, it, it's their tradition. Um, in, uh, in, in, in French, you would say spatronaut. Mm -hmm. And in, in the English, we, we use the term astronaut to, just uh, as a generic and the, the European Corps is the European Astronaut Corps. So a European astronaut is an astronaut. We are selected as astronauts. The Americans um, select ASCANs, astronaut candidates, and they don't become astronauts until they finish their basic training. Uh -huh. so, I see. Uh, for, for Europeans, um, um, the way it works is you are selected, you go, you're selected as an astronaut, and then you go through basic training, and you graduate from basic training, and we, we would say that you're, you're an astronaut, and now you're a, a, a viable astronaut that can be, a, can be assigned to missions. Um, so I finished basic training uh, right away uh, after about 14 months of training, and was assigned to a flight right, right away. As soon as I finished basic training, I was assigned to a mission 36, 37. And because it takes about two years to train for a mission, that's that's why I flew only in uh, May of 2013 for the first time. But I was the first one in my class to be assigned and to fly. Yeah, but, and, but if uh, and you train when you are assigned. Mm -hmm. uh, so in basic training, uh, the European astronauts have their own basic training program too. Uh, and the same for the Russians. They have their own basic training program. The Americans, the Japanese, and Canadians all share a basic training program, which is run by NASA. So. Usually what happens is that in a class of, uh, basically almost every class of American astronauts has some Canadians and Japanese. They take advantage of, the, of a class starting in, uh, in Houston to select the, their own uh, Japanese astronauts and the Canadian astronauts. Not every time, but most times. And I mean, if you're gonna go big, then I mean, then do it properly. Your first mission was a long mission. It was at the at the time the space shuttle uh, retired, and uh, basically we went into what is called a single flow to launch. You start training, and after after two two years, you are ready to fly for about six months on the space station. So I also happened at the time to be the youngest astronaut to do a long duration mission. And you did six months. Yes, I was up in orbit for 166 days, which is five and a half months, and um, and I launched on May 28th of 2013, and then I landed on November 11th of the same year for a total of about five and a half months. And at the time, and I think that is still uh, the youngest astronaut. I, I I I was 36 years old when I when I flew. Wow. Now you you were of the generation after the shuttle, so you actually flew the Soyuz rockets. Uh, before you tell me what it's like to fly in a Soyuz rocket, I mean you obviously can't compare the two because you didn't experience the shuttle launch. 
Would it have been the same? I don't know. But before I do that, uh, Nicole Stott sends her love. She said that I must send her regards because I got to speak to her on Monday. And uh, she said I must send her fondest regards to you. Nicole is a, is, a, is a great friend, a fantastic astronaut and an artist. She is. Uh, makes everybody else envious because I, I, I'm, I can do a lot of things, but, but I, you know, when I try to, uh, to be an artist, it's like I have, a, um, instead of a, of a hand, I have a paw and uh, no opposable toes. So it's, it's really. <laughs> okay, before we hear your sub story, you, you can tell the people that you have done one or two Iron Men. Yes. So, so, so you can have pause like that. If you could complete an <laughs> Iron Man, I think you still get the credit for it anyway. That is amazing. So tell us yeah, about your, yeah. your launch in, in a Soyuz rocket. The, the launch is actually very, very smooth. And uh, that is the, the, biggest, uh, the, the biggest surprise, I would say. Um, and what I've heard coming from astronauts that have flown the two machines, the, the space shuttle and the Soyuz, is uh, the, the space shuttle, from, from stories that I've heard, is shakes a lot, and if you read books of astronauts that flew the shuttle, it's, it's a very scary, dynamic experience, where everything shakes and rumbles, and then you go up, and then all of these motions. The Soyuz is actually very, very smooth. It, it, it starts and you feel this rumble coming up through the structure, through your chest. But actually, um, you, you go up and because the staging, which is the different parts of the rocket, fall out in a, in a, in a way that the, the next stage is already on by the time the previous stage is done, the transition is really smooth. If you, see, if you watch a movie uh, of the Apollo missions or or even Gemini, what happens is that um, they have one stage stopped working and then separation and you see the astronaut fall forward, slam and then slam back into the seat. This doesn't happen in the Soyuz, it just, you know, you have the acceleration, it goes and you feel this hand squashing your chest and then as the pre, and then you have, the, 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 we speak because you have two stages at the same time, but then the previous stage falls out and it relaxes a little bit. So, you have this, uh, this um, sensation of being squashed that goes up and down, and then, you know, eight minutes and 48 seconds later, you know, the last engine shuts down, and you're in orbit. You were, all, less than nine minutes before, you were at zero altitude, zero speed, and now you are 250 kilometers above the Earth, and you're traveling at 28,000 kilometers an hour. That is incredible. So now I, I, I've got lots of questions, but I want to give these kids all a chance to ask questions. But we do have one or two special guests that have joined us. Uh, they are not actually in South Africa or in America. They're in Europe, but they're not in Italy, yet they are studying Italian. And they want to know if they can ask you a question in Italian, which you'll have to translate for us because we won't know what they actually are. Well, I could probably guess it. But let me see. Uh, where did I put those questions? I had them over here. Um, here we go. All right. We have a question. Um, I, I'm not sure of the name of the person. They didn't put a name here. But... But I'll ask the teacher, She, Marina, you are in the group. Do you want to uh, maybe help us out a little bit? Uh, I'm going to find you here in the list. And I'm going to try and unmute you. There we go. Hello, Marina. How are you? Hello, Steve. Very well, thank you. So do you want to ask us the question on behalf of the student in Italian? And then maybe Luca can help us out there. All right. Uh, ciao, Luca. Sono Marina, insegno uh, la lingua italiana come la seconda uh, lingua straniera in una scuola media, possiamo dire, uh, in uh, una piccola città in Serbia. E I miei studenti um, uh, sono un po' confu confusi a domandarti e allora ho deciso di farlo io invece di loro, uh, se per te va bene Posso, posso domandarti? Certo, bene. Ok. 
Okay, so maybe you want to just tell us what she said. I thought she was ordering pasta. That's what it sounded like to me. But what did she ask? <laughs> so if you want me to translate, Steve, uh, Marina said that she teaches Italian as a second language in a small town in Serbia. And her students are a little shy. And so she wants, she asked me if, if I was okay with her asking the question, which of course she said, by all means, uh, pasta and pizza. <laughs> And then, and then what did she actually... Oh, has she not asked the question yet? Not yet. Uh, oh, okay, so she hasn't even got to the question yet. All right, what's the question? Vai Marina con la domanda. Okay, uh, loro ti domandano uh, quali sono i tuoi progetti in futuro? Perché hai uh, spiegato uh, come hai cominciato. E allora hai qualche progetti in futuro. So so the question is, what are my future projects? Since we started this conversation with the, the beginning of my career, they want to know what my uh, my future projects are. I will I will give a quick answer in in uh, in Italian and then continue in English if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Allora, per Marina e i suoi studenti in uh, in Serbia, io al momento sono ancora a Houston perché um, per adesso come tutti siamo bloccati tra virgolette dalle restrizioni dovute alla, alla pandemia in, in corso. Eh, quando questa, questa emergenza pandemica finirà, il progetto che per adesso mi è stato proposto è de, di entrare in Germania per prendere la mia posizione come capo ufficio del capo ufficio equipaggi e mi occuperò del supporto di, a, di, tu, di tutte le parti eh, di una missione dei, dei, dei prossimi dei prossimi voli dei miei colleghi quindi dal, dal supporto a terra eh, in orbita e al rientro questo sarà il mio prossimo lavoro poi per altri progetti ovviamente eh, questo è un progetto molto importante che ha un inizio e una fine poi io sono un astronauta quindi il mio lavoro è quello di volare e mi aspetto di tornare in orbita eh, per una prossima missione quando sarà il momento buon per me so uh, did anyone understand Very that? Quickly. Maybe you can give us a little bit of an update. What are you going to be doing um, f in the next couple of years? Because obviously, uh, with this COVID-19 uh, situation, most people are, are down unless you are doing essential work. Uh, is the work that you're doing considered essential? So right now, my work is uh, considered... Um, the only work that is considered essential is direct support to the space station. The only people that are going to work uh, at Johnson Space Center or uh, the other control centers are those that are flight controllers and flight directors. They Because they have to be there in order for the space station to fly. Today, my crewmates Jessica and, and uh, Drew are coming back to Earth. So obviously those operations are, are very complex and they need everybody's support. So those flight controllers and directors are uh, in their workplace. My work right now is not essential, so I do a lot of work from home. Mostly it's uh, a lot of interviews, um, some of them for the public, most of them are actually debriefing. I do interviews with the, uh, with the groups and the teams that do uh, work for the space station program uh, in order, and we, we try to bring our fresh experience on orbit to them so that they can ameliorate and, and make things better for the future for the future crews. Um, what my answer was in terms of what are my future projects, uh, the intention of my boss is that as soon as this pandemic emergency is over uh, and not, not before September anyway, uh, he would like me to go back to Germany where we have the European Astronaut Center and uh, take over the crew office. The wow. crew office is the one office that, uh, for the European Space Agency that basically takes care of all the needs of an astronaut from, from the moment that it is assigned all the way uh, to the end of the mission after landing. The crew office is in charge, the crew office is in charge for the, the communication to and from the ground. Um, so the, the so-called Eurocoms uh, are are going to uh, are be belong to the to the crew office. We take care of all the provisions for the European astronauts. We take care of their families and all the arrangements um, in the lead up to the flight, during the flight, and post flight. So that 
that would be my job for the next couple of years. But then I added, of course, I am still an astronaut, relatively young. I, I know I look, I, I probably look old to all these kids, but I'm only 43 years old, which in, in astronaut's age is relatively young, and I'm also relatively experienced. So I hope that in the next few years, I will also find another mission that I can be assigned to so that I can go back to space. So when you are on your next mission, I will speak to the guys at ESA. We would love to do a live uh, session while you are in space. I think it would be so cool to have you do experiments and get things floating around while we're actually chatting to you. Well, uh, it depends on where I, where I will be. I would certainly be super excited to do something like that. Don't forget that videos of the experiments on the space station are available on uh, on all the all the platforms. Uh, we, uh, as a matter of fact, if you go on YouTube you can see a tour of the International Space Station performed by me and Drew Morgan in one take from beginning to end. It's a one hour uh, movie uh, and we, we shot it on, on January 1st of this year. It's the, the most updated um, space station. And we go from, from one end of, of the space station to the other and we talk about every single module and everything that happens. So even though it's not live, it's, it's still uh, a lot of information. It's in, in very common language. We try to talk about everything. Mm, but you see, how do we know that it's not trick photography? That's why if we do it live and we ask you to do certain things, we know it's really happening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for all the, uh, for all the, um, uh, the, the, the theory that are out there that, that is all a scam. Uh, it's really, really, really hard to find to find a place on Earth where you are floating for uh, over an hour. Okay? This is true. Actually, impossible to do that. So, if you see somebody floating for an hour without any without any stops and any editing, you know that it's that it's being shot. That the movie is being shot. For There's a good chance that some of the people that are going to get a chance to ask you questions will be floating around. And uh, there we go. I think we've just found a counter example. So I'm going to pick some people that would like to ask some questions. Um, let's have a look. Put up your hand if you want to ask a question. I'm just looking around if you've got your camera up. Sophia, I'm going to unmute you. Sophia, what question would you like to ask? Um, I'd like to ask a question about the planet. A little bit louder. I'd like to ask a question about planets. About planets? What do you want to ask? Yeah. Well, I saw, I saw this in a book and also on YouTube and I saw that there are actually just five dwarf planets. But also I, I've seen on YouTube that, they, um, that the third dwarf planet from the, the sun, they call on YouTube they call it Maki Maki and at the planetarium they call it Make Make. I want to know which one it is. I want to know if it's make make or maki maki. Is it maki maki or make make? Do you know what she's talking about, Luca? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have never heard of this, and uh, so I, I apologize for not being a planetary expert. I, I am a, I am an astronaut, not an astronomer, so that is really not my specialty. I do have one of my best friends who is an astronomer, so. I promise that I will ask him next time I have a chance. I could probably text him right now. He's in Europe, so I, 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 prob I, I believe that he will probably be able to answer that question for uh, for you. But I, I, I am not. As far as Pluto being a dwarf planet, this is a, uh, a, a, a you know the, 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 there is a whole turf war going on about whether Pluto is a dwarf planet, whether it's, it's a planet. I don't think Pluto really cares. Uh, <laughs> the, the truth is that Pluto just is. He's certainly a planetary body, uh, circling, circling our our sun, and it is it is a limitation of us humans. We want to put everything into little box and give it names and classify things, but. Honestly, you can have planetary bodies that are small all the way to something that are almost close to a star. The planet that's behind Steve in the picture, Jupiter, uh, 
at one point could have become a, a twin star of our sun. It's so big and massive, and it just didn't. Does it make it? Does that then make a giant star, a giant planet, or a or a or a missed star? It doesn't matter. It is what it is, and Pluto is what it is. It's a planet. It's a definitely uh, in its own uh, uh, existing uh, body. It's it's really uh, our own small uh, understanding that tries to qualify and put things into little boxes. But science is not done like that. Science really doesn't care. Science considers everything. What we call physics sometimes is chemistry. What we call chemistry sometimes is biology. And what we call biology sometimes is physiology. It doesn't matter. It's our problem that our brains are so small that we cannot fit everything. So you choose, you pick what you want to consider Pluto. And as far as I'm concerned, it's also your choice if you want to say mech mech or mat mat, whatever you like best. <laughs> well, anything that sounds like sushi, I'm going to call it maki maki. I'll take it. So let's go to, Ju now before Julio, before you ask your question, Jules, um, I just want to know, um, a lot of people want to know, are you still in the US? Are you back in Europe? Where's your family? What, what's happening? So I was very lucky. When I landed, I was taken to Germany for what we call the baseline data collection. Uh, I was taken to Cologne, where we have a specific environment called MDHAP, where the astronauts go to have, you know, all their or the or their body checked and uh, all our systems uh, measured to compare them before the flight and during the flight and after flight to see what changes there are and also to see how we're doing in terms of health. After that, about three weeks after that, I was sent back to Houston because this is where currently I have my home and where my family is, my wife and my two daughters. After that, that uh, about a week after that, it's when the pandemic emergency really uh, came out and about and the restrictions started. And so now I'm, luckily I am at home, what I call home, because that's where my family is. So I'm in Houston currently. Okay, so you obviously stuck. Well, I mean, the youth, but but when we when we say that you're Italian, your heart is in Italy, but right now your home is actually in the US. Is that correct? I think home is where your family is. Okay. It doesn't matter what flag you have. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> as a matter of fact, as 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 a matter of fact, as an astronaut, one of my dreams is planet Earth home. You know, I, I dream of the day when some some of these kids that are so young right now are looking at me and you know, they will be, hopefully, they will be tra traveling much further than I can, than I ever will. And then when they come from some extraordinary flight, they will get into the Earth orbit, will look down on our planet and see its uh, beautiful lands and seas and say, I'm home. Awesome, awesome. All right, Jules, fire away. What was the hardest part of your training? Ah, uh -huh. that's one of my favorite questions, Julia. And I, and, um, I was ready for this question. So <laughs> here's the trick. Here's the trick. I don't really like superlatives. I never, I try never to think of, this is my best memory. This is my worst memory or moment. This is my, the hardest training, this is the easiest one. Because guess what? When you're doing something that you really, really enjoy, even if it's hard, do, does it, does it, do you think, oh, that's, that's so hard? Or do you think, hmm, that's a challenge that I really, I really want to get this done? Um, Steve, if you can unmute Julia, I want, to have, I want to ask her a question. Let me quickly see if I can find Julia to un... I, I have her. I have oh, you her. can unmute. You, you are the host. You are the host. Okay. So, Julia, do, do, you do, any, do you do any sport? Yeah. What sport do you do? Soccer. You play soccer. Fantastic. So, when, when you're training for your soccer, uh, for your soccer matches, and you're there in the field, and it's hot, is it hard? Uh, I just say keep going, even if it's hard, you can still do this. You can still do it because you enjoy what you do and you like winning. So it's the same when you're not an astronaut. Sometimes 
the training that we do can be really, really tough. For example, when you train underwater in the spacesuit, it can be really fatiguing. You come out and your shoulders hurt, your hands hurt, you have um, welts all over your body from where the pressure suit is uh, uh, squatting you. But at the same time, you come out and you know you have accomplished something that is very important to you and it's gonna help you. So um, we, we do a lot of training that can be considered hard. For example, I had to learn Russian in record time so I had to fly with the Russian spacecraft. I had to learn how to fly the Soyuz spacecraft. I had to learn how to fly the robotic arm. I had to learn how to use a, a spacesuit so that I could operate and do spacewalks. All those things are considered hard. Is one of them harder than another? At one point or another, they were all hard and they all became interesting. Then because they were interesting, I wasn't thinking anymore about how hard they were, but I was concentrating on how interesting it was and how much I wanted to do more. So that's how I approach things. Um, I believe that when something is interesting, usually it, it, start, it comes hard at the beginning. Uh, such uh, adventures that are easy are usually not very interesting. So I have stopped for a long time already to think about something being hard. Instead, I think, how much do I want to do it? How interesting it is? And that's how I, that's how I go about. Just like playing on a soccer field on a very hot day. I don't think about, you probably don't think about how hot it is. You probably think how much you want to put that goal, that, that ball into the goal and, uh, and score. So that's how we think about it. Great one. Um, Tammy, you wanted to ask something. Tammy, what did you want to ask? No, we can hear you, Tam. Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Is it cold in space? Uh, good question. So, I, uh, first of all, inside the space station, we have an atmosphere that is controlled. So, inside the space station, it's not cold at all. Actually, if you look, if you look at the live feed from uh, from the International Space Station, you will see that most astronauts just work around in uh, uh, in, in t-shirts because it's, it's, quite, it's quite comfortable and it's, uh, it's pleasant. And uh, um, in, in Celsius, the temperature goes between 22, 24 degrees, depending on the module, depending whether it's the sun, on the sun part of the orbit or the night part of the orbit. So it's quite comfortable. On the outside, on the other hand, it can be very cold. When we are in the night pass of the orbit, the temperature can, is over around minus 150 degrees Celsius. Now, when I say the temperature, that's not the outside temperature, it's the surface temperature of the space station or the space suit because you cannot measure temperature in vacuum. So it doesn't, so you have to touch something in order to measure the temperature. So that's what I'm, when I say minus 150 degrees, if, if you had a thermometer and put it on the surface of the, of the suit, that's what you measure. In the in the in the darkness, when we are on the other side of the of the orbit, when the sun is shining on us, now the surface temperature is plus 150 degrees Celsius. So it's really really hot. That's why we are grateful that we have a spacesuit that protects us from those from those temperatures, because otherwise it, you would be frozen on one side and broiled on the other side. Wow. Now, uh, I know we're still going to ask lots of questions, but one thing that we, we have chatted before, but, but maybe just for, for the students here, you were doing a spacewalk and something very interesting happened to you that apparently also happened to someone straight after you as well using the same spacesuit. What was oh, that, I know what you, I what know what was that incident? About. So, well, in, uh, in, in my second... During my second spacewalk back in 2013, uh, my, my spacesuit actually failed. I had a major emergency uh, that had never happened before. My, um, the, what we call the life support system, uh, which is the backpack of the suit. You know, the, the suit has a backpack and the little man in the front. The actual spacesuit is, is the backpack. The front is just a pressurized balloon. So my backpack, which contains all the system and everything that makes us 
are capable of living and operating in vacuum tail. And the, the suit started spraying water into my helmet. And so, it, it, you know, it, it started filling up and it covered my eyes, it covered my nose, it covered my ears. It was night, so it wasn't pleasant. And, uh, and so we, we had to interrupt the, the spacewalk and, and I had to go back inside in emergency. Then after that, we fixed it, we fixed the suit. And then about a, about a year and a half later, one of my, one of my classmates uh, was out in uh, doing an EVA and the other crewmate in Cobra uh, saw some drops of water coming back into his helmet. It was not the same problem. It, it was the same suit, but it was not the same problem. But because we had learned that it's um, you know, that it can become an emergency, uh, he, they had completed the primary job, so they went back inside and uh, just to make sure that everything was okay. The suit was okay. It's now back on Earth and it's being refurbished. Um, it, it was two very different emergencies. Um, my uh, for, luckily, my emergency has not happened again. And it probably never will because we found out what the problem was, we fixed it, and uh, uh, we are now waiting for the next problem. And, and then, of course, the question comes in terms of trauma. I mean, that kind of experience must have been terrifying. Then you still had to do another spacewalk uh, on your next mission. How did you feel about climbing out, worrying that maybe this sort of thing might happen to my suit again? I mean, did it cause you any trauma at all? Not at all. Uh, well, see, the, um, uh, first of all, you have to trust your capabilities, but most, most of all, you have to trust the people that put you in that situation. You have to trust the engineers, the designers, the team that, that uh, is uh, in charge because it's their responsibility. And it's, it, when, you, when you're an astronaut, you cannot be in charge of everything. You cannot, be, you cannot control the environment. So you have a lot of people making sure that everything is in the right place at the right time. So um, the, the same way I flew that the day after having an aircraft accident as a pilot, uh, you know, I climbed into the airplane and flew the mission just as, uh, as any other day. I was ready to go outside with the suit uh, the next day if I had to. Had the, in, if the engineers had told me, hey, we fixed the problem, you're ready to, you're good to go, that's my job. I mean, risks are, are present in everything you do. And uh, it's not an acceptance of the risk, it's understanding what the risks are. And uh, in a way, risks is, uh, is like salt. Uh, you, you want to have a little salt in the food you eat so that it has a little bit of flavor. And life without risks is flavorless. So it's important to have a little bit so that it's interesting and, uh, and has a little bit of flavor, but you shouldn't exaggerate so that it spoils it. Ha, huh. I've never heard of risk being described as salt. That is a very interesting one. But now Luke wants to ask you something. Luke Dutoy, what would you like to ask? I would like to ask how do you feel or how is it like when you, so when you either getting out of your rocket, it's, so let's say you're in, the, you want to go to the National Space Station, or you're, so you're near it and you're tra being transferred across. So being in your rocket, like getting out of your rocket into the space station, or um, getting out of your rocket onto the moon or whatever. Like how, how does it feel? Like so, so in other words, you want to know about the process of, of getting from the rocket to the International Space Station and, and yes, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Well, so um, that, that is an interesting question because it, uh, actually that is not how the process works. When, uh, when you launch into space and, uh, and you are in your spacecraft, which in my case was the, uh, the Soyuz, the, the, way, the way we go from the Soyuz into the space station is through docking. So the, the, the the aircraft becomes, the spacecraft becomes part of the space station. It docks, they, the two parts are pressurized together and sealed, and then we open hatches on both sides, and you just walk, you just fly, fly into uh, the space station and vice versa in, in, in a t-shirt and, and, uh, 
and, and trousers because it's now that spa the spacecraft has become part of the space station. You don't have to go out of the spacecraft into vacuum and back inside the space station. And that is that is true for all the missions from from the Apollo missions through the space shuttle, uh, through the International Space Station. That's what we've always done. We go from one spacecraft into the other by docking and pressurizing and creating a volume uh, so that we can go back and forth. If we had to go outside, we would perform basically what I just described, a space walk. So uh, it is possible. I mean, it's, it's never been done even in contingency, but that's what they did on the moon. Um, they landed on the lunar landing uh, module or land. They went out, walked about, uh, had a little bit of fun, and then went back inside and s went straight up to the to their for the rendezvous. They docked again, and then uh, once again, that's how that's how you do it. Now I know that in some movies, it's um, they have this. Uh, scenes where you go from one spacecraft, you go outside your spacesuit and then you get into another spacecraft and then doff your spacesuit. That's not how we actually do things. So um, the, it's actually pretty easy to go from one spacecraft into another when you are docked. And of course they are traveling at 28,000 kilometers an hour, so incredible precision is required to get them to dock. Um, Damian Dimitrov, something like that, would like to know if you would be able to give him a ride in a spacecraft because today is his birthday. And he thought maybe he, you could arrange something for him, something special on his birthday. <laughs> well, um, my recommendation, rather than trying to have me, Take you to the to the space station since it's gonna it's gonna take me quite a while before I, before I'm gonna go up again since I just came back. Uh, get in touch with the next astronauts flying to the space station. Maybe they can give you a ride. The, the next uh, spacecraft that's, that that should be flying to the space station is called uh, Dragon, and it will fly sometimes in May. And um, I know that there are only two astronauts flying up to the space station on that spacecraft, and there is space for more people. So. If you're lucky, they will uh, get your. Uh, they, they will uh, listen to you and take you for a ride. Who knows? I mean, it doesn't cost anything to write to NASA and say, "Hey, it's my birthday. I'm gonna fly to space." Then. I would I definitely be right. But they can. So, so I've just loaded a photograph that uh, might look <laughs> a bit familiar to you. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Because someone wanted to know, um, how do you actually eat in space? <laughs> Oh, that picture, I should remember that. So, um, in terms of how you eat, let's, start, let's answer first uh, the, the, the question. You eat normally, and your, your body is capable of uh, chewing and swallowing and digesting in any orientation. Uh, it probably comes from the fact that we evolved from water creatures, and in water, the effect of, the effect of gravity are not as accentuated as on Earth, and so, um, you can actually, don't try this at home, but if you were upside down, you could still grab a cookie, chew it, and swallow it, and your digestive system will do the rest of the work. It will go, even if you're upside down, it will still go for it in your mouth, your stomach, and digest, and everything. So, uh, we eat normally. We have all kinds of different foods. The only things that's different when you're in orbit are how you prepare food. Uh, usually, uh, food is already pre-cooked, and either we have to just warm it up or we have to just or to add water. But you would be able to recognize all of the food we eat uh, once, once it's prepped. I mean, when you add water, usually for, uh, uh, for some of the meats or for uh, some of the chicken, uh, like if you like curry or uh, things like those, once you add water, it looks just like a normal, normal meal. And for the pre-cooked food, it's just like the ones you buy at the supermarket. You put it in the microwave and it pops out and it's ready. We don't have a microwave oven, but we have a warmer and just an electrical uh, electric plate that heats up the food and it comes out and it, it, then you just eat. Now, that picture that I'm, that I'm looking at right now, that is something different. Uh, one company wanted to see if, we, if you sent up uh, cookie dough, raw 
cook it up. Would you be able to actually cook it in orbit? And how long would it take? What temperature would it take? And what would it be like? Uh, would, the, would the cookie actually be edible, look the same, does it taste the same? So they came up with, a, they came up with, a, with an idea. They sent up a, a, a novel. Uh, and uh, and cookie dough in those little packages that you see there, and then they picked the Italian uh, to <laughs> the Italian to be the chef and actually <laughs> uh, prep all the cookies. And so it was an experiment. And uh, I had a, a batch of about ten different cookies, which we cooked at different different temperature for different times. And finally, this is the one that looked and that smelled the best. And because Christina in the picture, she's such a sport, when she smelled the smell of the cookie, she prepped some milk, which is that bag that you can see there. She, um, that there is some uh, milk that she rehydrated. She added water and you shake it and it tastes like milk. So one afternoon after I had that cookie come out of the oven smelling so good, she had the, the milk, which she drank. She could not eat the cookie because the cookie is an experiment. So we had to send them back to ground. And now the company that can, that create the uh, design the oven is actually analyzing the cookies that we send out to see if they are resembling anything that would be uh, comparable to what we cook on the ground. Wow! But we thought it was in, we thought it was a cool experiment, and that's why I have the oven mitts, and I'm making an okay sign because they're like, hey, it looks okay. <laughs> but of course, eating is one thing. Um, but then, of course, when you finish eating. And another process does take place and I thought I would just throw in a photograph that might ring some bells. What is that all about? So that is, this, I can tell you that that picture is quite old because that's not what the look, toilet looks like anymore. It, uh, we have installed a new, uh, a new stall uh, on the side. So that, that was from my previous picture. So what we're looking at here is basically uh, exactly what it looks like in any other uh, toilet in the world. You have a uh, you have a seat, uh, and you have a bucket, and then uh, exactly that's the seat. The the white one, the white part is the seat which is currently closed, and then you pushed on that uh, on that button right there, and it opens up, and you have uh, the shape of a little butt where you put your your butt cheeks, and then the the bucket there is what contains it so when, 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 when you when you have to go for the big one what you do is you turn on the system and you see that tube that comes out on the side that goes to a back to basically a vacuum cleaner it creates a flow of air the flow of air uh, guides the solid waste let's call it like that it then guides the solid waste into the bucket so that it's dead, it stays there and it doesn't come out. And then uh, there is a, uh, we actually install little, little uh, uh, bags so that each individual user uh, can, can contain its solid waste and go. All these little, these little bags eventually end up in the bucket until the bucket is full. Now, if you look up a little bit uh, up and right, you see the yellow funnel. The yellow funnel uh, is for number one. So when when you have when you drink to when you drink and you now you you know now you have to go. Again, you turn on the same the same system. It creates a flow of air inside the tube, and you can see the tube coming down from underneath the plastic the the, the white bag. There's a little bit of brown tube, exactly. The brown tube is, um, you know, we, you go into the, the funnel, you, uh, you go for number one and your liquid waste now goes out, it goes through the tube, but now instead of being contained into a bucket like a solid waste, it goes into a system that cleans out all the urine, all the pee pee, gets cleaned out and in a process that lasts about 10 days. And so what, what came out yellow 10 days ago now becomes transparent again and you can drink it again and you will drink it again. Everybody goes and the whole, all the crew uses the same toilet and all the urine gets collected 
melted together, it gets processed, and then you drink it again, and it turns yellow again in a, in a process where we, we recover 95% of the water that's on the space station. Now, I can see all your faces, and I see like you're, you're all going, I can't believe you're drinking this stuff. Well, let me tell you one. Here's a little secret. Dear Julia, I can see you. <laughs> Julia is squirming. So, Julia, you have to know that all the water, all of the water on planet Earth, all of it, the oceans, the rivers, and the one you just drank this morning, that water has been the same for 4 billion years. It hasn't changed. So the water you drank this morning, 500 million years ago, was some dinosaur pee-pee. So it just got filtered over and over again. It, you know, it turned into rain and then back into, into and then back into the lake, and then it was drunk by a uh, saber-toothed tiger, and then it was peed again, and then and it got rain, and, and then it was, again, some, some um, Neanderthal drank it uh, 20,000 years ago, and now you drank it again this morning. So all the water has always been the same. There's no difference. Only on the space station, we do it in 10 days, and, uh, and we check that to make sure that it's really clean. Ah, but now you are bemoaning the fact that you're not a great artist, but but actually you have a range of skills and you are the first astronaut DJ to actually do a set from space. Is this true? <laughs> I, oh gosh. <laughs> uh, yes. <it. laughs> no, uh, yeah, I did that. I did a DJ set and I actually also rapped. Uh, a, a rap song from space uh, a couple of the uh, couple of weeks later so this is uh, the DJ set with the World Club Dome and what happened is that I have a friend that is a professional DJ and he said hey Luca do you think you could do a DJ set from space and I said no I don't think I can but if you teach me how to do it I'll do my best and that's exactly what I did so I was in uh, Columbus uh, that's the module uh, behind me and is he, my friend, sent me an app that is um, um, just like a DJ uh, table set that where you can mix and, uh, and, and uh, mix, mix, mix songs and send them up. And then I, I did just that for about, for about 10 minutes from the space station. I, I played a few songs and, uh, you know, even though I, 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 I'm, I'm terrible at this kind of stuff, but I was having fun and so, uh, and I like to be, to be out of my comfort zone to try different things. And that's the same reason why a couple of weeks later I did this uh, rapping session uh, <laughs> during, during a concert that was uh, rapping to an Italian song. I, I bet that Marina and some of the students probably have heard of uh, the Italian rapper Giovanotti and his song Non Manoio, I Don't Get Bored. And that's what I sang from the space station. That is awesome. But now someone <laughs> wanted to know if I can find the picture, uh, coming back to Earth is is obviously a very interesting process because with a shuttle you'd fly back like an aeroplane, but not when you're using a Soyuz module. What happens in this process, and 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 is it really a big thump? Do you get? I mean, do you feel it? What what's the story there? So, um, you know, it's exactly the opposite of what I was saying at the beginning, where. Launching with a shuttle is, uh, is a very dynamic and very, uh, you know, this fumble and tumble and shaking. And then I heard that the landing was pretty smooth, just like you said, a little bit of acceleration, but, you know, a smooth landing. The Soyuz, it's a smooth launch, but then coming back is, uh, is very, very, very dynamic. It's, um, there are all these different phases. So initially, you, you just, you Remember, you're flying at 28,000 kilometers an hour, and what you have to get down to zero in order to get out of the spacecraft on Earth. So you have to lose a lot of speed in order to land. So how do we do that? We, if we wanted to use the engines to, to slow down and land, we would have to use the same amount of fuel that we use on the way up. So it would be an incredible waste. Instead, we use Friction. If you if you take your finger and you put it on the table and push, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna experience friction. It slows your finger down, and it gets warm at the same time. 
when you go when you move this, you, you feel friction. You you want to move your hand, but it doesn't, and instead it slows down and it, and, it, and it heats up. We do that same thing coming back. We use the atmosphere to slow us down. So what we do is we're flying at 400 kilometers, 20,000 kilometers an hour, and we slow down just a tiny bit. We turn the engines on for four minutes, and we slow us down by 128 meters per second. So we're flying at 8,000 meters per second, and we take 128 out of that, and it's, it's, it's enough to, to lower our orbit, orbit a tiny bit. We lower the orbit, and then we separate the spacecraft in three parts, and what is left is um, the, the, the capsule that looks like a, a bell. Now, once that bell hits the higher part of the atmosphere, it, it experiences friction. It starts getting hit by, the, by the, all the particles of the atmosphere, and, and it starts slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and it, it heats up quite a bit. As a matter of fact, it forms a little plasma where the ions are so hot around us that they, they are about uh, 1,500 degrees, and it's almost like a fluid, and it burns everything but not the capsule because we have a protecting shield. And all through this, we are feeling this giant hand squashing us on our chest because we that's, that's the deceleration. That is our braking system. It's like we are braking so fast that we go from 8,000 kilometers per second in the arc of about six, seven minutes to 400 kilometers per second. And that's when we come out of the atmosphere at about 15,000, 15 kilometers above the ground. Now, 400 meters per second, that's still pretty fast. You, you wouldn't want to land at that speed. So now uh, we have to come out with a way to slow us down a little bit. And the way we do it is with parachutes. So we have three different parachutes. First, we have, we have one that kind of stabilizes the spacecraft. This is just a, it's basically a giant ball of fire. We are coming down, and we need to stabilize it. So we have this little parachute that comes out, and it stabilizes us. And inside the spacecraft, we're just, we're just shook left and right with our, in our spacesuit, with our belts. And once it stabilizes, now we have an instructor parachute that comes out, which basically is a tiny parachute that pulls out a big, massive parachute that is designed in a way that it opens up slowly. It opens up slowly, and while it's opening up inside the spacecraft again, we, are, we feel that we are tumbling left and right, we are rolling, and then it's stabilized, and now we're just coming down at about six meters per second. Six meters per second is the same speed that you would have at impact as if you were to jump out of the second floor of a house. So if nothing else happened, you would still survive the impact, but it would be uncomfortable. So instead, what we have, right before we impact, right before we hit the ground, one second, and we have four retro rockets. They are rockets that point this way, and they fire all at once, and they create a pillow of air, and that one slows us down when we, when we hit the ground to about one meter per second, which is a lot more comfortable. If everything works and there is no wind, like on my second flight, we just hit the ground like that. And all we hear, all we feel is this. It's it's like um, it, it's like a fender bender. Like if you are at an intersection and somebody is not paying attention, and the traffic light goes back goes uh, red, and somebody just bumps into you, and that's all you feel. And you're like, well, I'm back on Earth. But if it's windy out there, now that's when things become interesting because on my first flight when we were coming back to ground, it was really windy. So we came in an angle. And at an angle, those four engines still fire, but they don't, they are not very effective. And so when you hit the ground, it feels like, like, a, like a tank hits you from the back. And, um, and so that one is a little more surprising. But there you <laughs> have the landing in about two minutes. Okay, so uh, have, you got a, have you got two or three more minutes on your side there, Luca? For these kids, always. Damn, that's what I like to see. All right, Ethan, I'm going to unmute you. What is your question, Ethan? Um, what does it feel like when uh, you come back 
apart from just no gravity in yeah good question Ethan it feels like to gravity food. does is there a difference oh yeah I don't know absolutely Ethan uh, when you come back after after a long time in orbit where you when you haven't had any when you have felt weightlessness for all this time what happens you feel like you weigh a ton uh, you just everything feels incredibly heavy even though you're in very good shape because you have to remember we work out every day two and a half hours a day we lift weights we we run we use a bicycle to keep our heart and our legs strong but 22 hours out of the day you're completely weightless and so your brain it decides that that's great and it, it forgets what it is like to have a weight so now you come back to ground and you step out of the spacecraft and your legs are like, whoa, what is all this stuff that they have to support? What is all this weight? Your neck says, wow, you, your, your noggin is pretty heavy. Your shoulders <laughs> are not used to lifting, lifting your arms and your, your spine is not used to stand up straight because you don't have to. So it takes about two weeks before you feel kind of normal again because your body is just not used to it. For the first couple of weeks, you're always tired because you have to you have to support your own body weight. And to me, the best way I can describe it is: imagine if you if you had another Ethan in front of you and you had to carry yourself all the time on top of your shoulder. That's how it feels. For a couple of days, you feel like you're you're just carrying another an, another person on your shoulder all the time, which is obviously it's yourself that you're carrying. Wow. Um, out of interest, apparently it's not just how you feel, but sometimes you forget that things don't float. And did you ever have a situation where you would walk around the kitchen, put your coffee mug in the air, walk away, and then realize that that's not going to float? Uh, it's never happened to me quite that way, but you do have the tendency to be a little more clumsy at the beginning. Not okay. quite to just dropping stuff in there because we actually don't do that very often on the space station. Um, if you on the space station, if you um, uh, if you leave if you leave something floating, there are uh, probably the, the very good chances that you're gonna lose it because it, it moves away really fast. Just nothing just stands and still in the air. So instead, what we do, we have Velcro, we have tape, and we just put things a little bit everywhere because they stay there. Now on Earth, you are you maybe you maybe not be as careful at the beginning. So let's say you have a mug of tea that you've been drinking, and you put it right on the edge of the table because on orbit it doesn't matter, and now on the ground it does because because you put it on the edge, and now it's not on the edge anymore; it's on the floor, and you have to make your tea again. That happens quite a bit. Wow. You tend to be a little more clumsy. Sure. All right, uh, Chet, you wanted to ask a question. And there's sure. also Rachel. Have you ever watched a, a movie or a space movie and then you've just nodded your head and realized how like unreal that is? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Basically, every, every sci-fi movie is very <laughs> unrealistic. There are very few movies that, that, are, that, that give me a sense of, uh, hey, they really studied this and uh, made it as realistic as it can be. Uh, for example, I would say that um, Apollo 13 is a great movie that is almost uh, documentaristic, um, but there, there are many others that, that do that. It's really, really, really hard to replicate weightlessness on the ground, and even in movies. And so, uh, to make the movies a little, a little more interesting, they usually, uh, they usually create a way to replicate gravity and uh, accelerate and uh, body weights on, on space. But that doesn't mean that the movies are not enjoyable anyway. I, I really enjoy movies like Interstellar or The Martian. Uh, those are all movies that even though they, they have that, uh, parts that may not be very, very realistic, are still well done. And the message that they bring is absolutely fantastic anyway. So um, I would say that it's a little bit like uh, if you're a policeman and you watch a, uh, you watch a detective story, and you're like, oh, that's not how it goes, but it's still, it's probably still a good movie. So. I'm sure lots of doctors do that when they're watching TV series as well. So one last question, because I know you've got lots of other things and we've got another interview coming up soon as well. Um, 
Are you still a rock star at home with your family? Are the girls are like, ah, oh, our dad's an astronaut? Or are you reminded and humbled on a regular basis that you are just dad and that is as far as it goes? 100% the second one. I don't think I was ever a rock star. <laughs> I think my daughters understand that the job I do is uh, is really cool, but the, that and, and I agree with them. It's the job I do is cool and interesting, but I'm just a regular dude. And uh, you know, on the you know, you if you meet me at the supermarket, you probably wouldn't, you definitely would not turn twice uh, uh, to, to look at me. I'm just a uh, just another bald guy with a goatee like the many other thousands. But the job I do, I agree, is really cool. So when I'm an astronaut, I'm an astronaut. When I'm at home or on the ground, I'm just another regular guy. Wow. So, so two things we want to say. Um, one, when when we do get this COVID thing over and sorted, we we want to try and get you out to South Africa to come and do some school visits and that type of thing. And we will try and coincide it with the Iron Man if you are still training, so that at least you can get some benefit out of it as well. And second of all, um, Mars is obviously big on everyone's agenda. What is your take on um, our, our uh, excitement about visiting Mars? Oh, wow. Uh, first of all, for the first question, I have never been to South Africa and I certainly need to, to go there. I, I, I've seen it several times from space and it looks beautiful. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea of uh, doing an Ironman there is actually very, very enticing. So uh, let's see what we can do about that. As for Mars, I, I still think that it's, it's a destination that will always be attractive to us. It's right there. It's the closest, uh, closest world. Uh, it, it, looks, it really looks like it's inviting us to, uh, to go and explore. And there are many secrets that we want to, uh, that we want to solve presence of methane, the water, uh, the cycles of, uh, of the seasons. We, we want to go there and understand more. We know that there are caves that we want to explore. There's so much about Mars. So I do think that it is, our, um, it is on our mind, both as humans and as, as explorers. And I know that the space agency really want to, uh, to put a man on, the, on, on Mars. Now, before we do that as, a, as an astronaut, I am interested in understanding how to do that the right way. It's more important to do it the right way than to do it the fast way. And in order to do that, I believe that going back to the moon and uh, uh, creating an, uh, a series of procedures and uh, and also coming up with the with the right materials and technology to do it safely is just as important. So. I am 100% on board to going back to the moon as uh, the space agencies are planning. Uh, and then, not my generation of astronauts, but the one that's looking at me right now, I'm staring at them, I'm looking at their faces, and I think that maybe among them, uh, there is that astronaut that will go to the moon, to, to, to Mars one day. And I will be lucky enough if I can uh, cheer for them on the ground, but, uh, and, and maybe give a little bit of support. But, um, my uh, my generation hopefully will go back to the moon. Okay, all right, boys and girls. I know that all of you were dying to ask questions, but we've run out of time. The sadness that prevails. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you all, and you guys all get to say goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Grazie, grazie. Thank you, boys and girls. And then, of course, Luca, we just need one last thing from you. Where's Luca? We've lost you. There you are. Luca, we just need one last thing from you. Um, oh, I need to pin you. There we go. We need a big smile from you so that we can make sure we choose the right thumbnail for the video because what happens is um, sometimes they don't there we go big smile got it got it got it excellent luca thank you so much bye bye everyone boys and girls we'll see you soon
Thanks, Luca. And then I'll send all the information through to Alessandra and, and they'll pass it on to you. Cool. Grazie, grazie. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.